Good morning, Tower Hill Christian Church. My name is John Clausen. I'm the Director of Development for the International Conference on Missions, otherwise known as ICOM. I think it's neat that I could speak to you this morning from my distance afar, and that you value missions enough to invite ICOM to come and be a part of this special Sunday at your church for Faith Promise. So I'm preaching to you this morning from my home church in Indiana, and I'd like to accomplish several things here this morning. I'd like to tell you a little bit about ICOM and the missions conference that we host each year. Then I would like to share with you a message from the book of Jonah and how that message applies to us today. As I get started here this morning, how many people are familiar with the International Conference on Missions? Raise your hand. <laughs> I do that. I say that as a joke to see if you're paying attention because obviously I cannot see you. <laughs> You may know I come under a different name. You may know us as the National Missionary Convention. We operate under that name for more than 60 years. In short, ICOM hosts a missions conference devoted entirely to missions. The conference is always in November each and every year. And this year, we hope to have a really large conference with more than 12,000 Christians from all over the world in Indianapolis at the convention center downtown. ICOM's mission is to encourage, equip, and enlist workers for the harvest. Most people, such as yourselves, come to connect. They come to connect to mission organizations and missionaries you already support. They come to connect to new missionaries and new organizations. They come to connect to speakers. They come to connect to resources. And they come to hear stories, testimonies, about how God is doing mighty works around the world. Let me share with you a little bit more about the conference. It's a five-day conference beginning on Wednesday and ending at noon on Sunday. This year's dates for the conference are November 18th through the 22nd. That's the weekend before Thanksgiving. The conference moves around from city to city across the Midwest each and every year. So just to give you an idea where we've been and where we're going, last year's conference was in Kansas City, Missouri. This year's conference is in Indianapolis, Indiana and next year's conference is in Richmond, Virginia. And usually ICOM somewhere in between those east and west points. ICOM has three main parts. The first are our main sessions, which is very similar to the worship that you're experiencing here this morning. And so we'll have a band come and lead us in song, uh, and then a series of men will offer messages devoted to missions. We have a lot of testimonies shared from missionaries on our main stage. So we have six main sessions over the four days. The second main part of the conference is our workshops. This year we hope to have more than 170 workshops covering every topic imaginable. Now obviously, uh, many of those workshops will be devoted to the subject of missions and, and many different types of mission workshops. But we have a lot of other different topics covered in these workshops as well. So topics such as personal growth, encouragement, making disciples, and elder leadership. The third main part of ICOM is our exhibit hall. This year's exhibit hall will feature more than 700 booths and 300 exhibitors. So imagine this for a second, if you will, an area the size of four football, football fields big, all with filled with booths serving God in many different ways around the world. This is where most people come to connect. And this is where most people spend the most time at the conference, connecting with each other, connecting with missionaries in the exhibit hall. So we have programming for little kids, little tykes, so that the parents can go and be encouraged and equipped, whether it be in our main sessions or in our workshops or the exhibit hall. And then we also offer programming for our older kids, our teens, designed to help them live out their faith better. ICOM wants to help every church and every Christian know how they can serve the kingdom of God beyond these church walls each and every Sunday. We want to encourage and equip you to better serve your community, whether that be on a local level or globally. The good news is that Derek has said that Tower Hill plans on registering for ICOM as a church this year. That means that the church has covered all of your registration costs leading into the conference. And that everyone, and I mean everyone under the Tower Hill umbrella, 
comes to the conference at no additional cost. We invite you to put ICOM on your calendar and come to the convention center downtown Indianapolis on November 18th through the 22nd. Come for as many days as you are able. When I think of missions, I think of the book of Jonah. It's a story that you are probably very familiar with. A man who attempts to run from the mission God gave him and is swallowed by a giant fish, or well, we don't know which. But there's so much more to the story than that, so much that is applicable to our lives today. Now, before we dig into Jonah directly, let's do a really quick overview of the book. This will be the Cliff Notes version for the test at the end. The book starts with God calling Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh to preach against its wickedness. But instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah boards a ship and flees in the opposite direction. God punishes Jonah for not listening and brings a storm against the boat and threatens to tear it apart. The sailors ultimately throw Jonah overboard and the storm calms. Then God saves Jonah by having a giant fish swallow him. Jonah spends three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. God causes the fish to vomit Jonah onto dry land. Now, create that mental picture there for a moment. Jonah was swimming in fish vomit. <laughs> okay, 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 well, that's, that's a bad uh, mental picture. Uh, but let, let, let's get back to the topic here. Uh, that is pretty much the first half of the book, right? The book is four chapters long, and that's the first two chapters. In the second half, God once again calls Jonah to go to Nineveh to preach. And this time, Jonah listens. He obeys God. And he preaches a really simple message. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overturned. The king and all the people of Nineveh believe in God and change their evil ways. Thus, God spares Nineveh and does not bring destruction on the city. Now we get to chapter 4, which has the most application for us today. Verse 1 says that Jonah is greatly displeased. Now, I think this is a really soft and kind way of saying that Jonah was really ticked off with God. So Jonah and God have this conversation back and forth. And during the conversation, Jonah decides that he's going to go outside the city and sit down and wait for God to bring destruction on the city. God causes a vine to grow to bring shade to Jonah in the afternoon. But then the very next day, God causes a worm uh, to come and eat the vine so that it withers and dies. And again, Jonah is very upset and has some conversation back and forth with God. But God's word is final. Woo! Did you get all that? You ready for the quiz now? <laughs> if you're like me, you have several questions that come to your mind when you read the book of Jonah. First, Jonah was told to preach fire and brimstone to a city that he really didn't like. But if he didn't like them, then why does he not go to the city to preach this very harsh message? Moreover, as we see in chapter 1, Jonah would rather die then obey God. And if so, why is that? And finally, in chapter 3, we see that the focus of the story is really not on the Ninevites, as we might expect, but rather the focus of the story is on Jonah. So our third and final question is, what is God trying to teach Jonah? We find an answer to our first two questions at the beginning of chapter 4. Jonah offers a prayer to God, and we see his heart. We see why Jonah would rather run from God than turn to God. Jonah knew that God was gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents in doing harm. Jonah is actually quoting scripture. He's quoting Exodus chapter 34. Jonah knew his Bible and he knew that God was gracious. He did not want God to show compassion on Nineveh. He did not want these heathens to receive blessings and forgiveness from God. Now, one reason for Jonah's probably hatred uh, towards the Ninevites is that the two countries are political enemies. These two countries have been at war with each other for decades. The best analogy that I can think of is the United States relationship, the Cold War with Russia during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. 
Growing up in the 1970s myself, I was taught to hate Russia. They were the United States' mortal enemies in every way. It didn't matter if it was politics, sports, they were our enemies. Another good example is drawn from sports. It's one thing to root for your favorite team, but it's another to hate their bitter, bitter rival. I grew up in Kankakee, Illinois, just outside of Chicago, and I'm a huge Bears fan. At the same time, I cannot stand the Green Bay Packers. I wish them no love, and that's a massive understatement. When I saw a recent report that said that Green Bay drafted terribly in the recent NFL draft that just happened here in the last two weeks, I cheered. I do not like Green Bay. Another reason why Jonah despised Ninevites so much is that it's very likely Jonah had seen Nineveh's wickedness carried out against the people of Israel. Think of it this way. God is asking him to go and show love to the people who had been hurting his church family. Another reason why Jonah despised the Ninevites is that Israel is God's chosen people. Jonah would rather see God's grace and blessings be poured out on Israel rather than Assyria. In addition, there are probably some personal ramifications here if God showers blessings on Assyria. Jonah was a popular prophet in Israel. And if it happens, if it appears that he is showing mercy on the enemy and helping the enemy, his career could be over. Jonah's anger with God demonstrates that Jonah disagreed with how God handled the situation. Jonah's trying to tell God how to behave. God's love and grace is wonderful when it's directed towards the people we love and care for. But God now is showing love and kindness towards Israel enemies. And in Jonah's opinion, they did not deserve it. What Jonah forgets or does not know is that no one deserves God's grace. Maybe sometimes we expect things from God, thinking that we deserve it. And if so, we are forgetting Romans chapter 3. There's no one righteous, no, not one. There's none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There's no one who does good. No, not one. No one deserves God's grace. Not Jonah, not Israel, not the Nevites, nor you or I. Jonah's attitude shows how mixed up his values and his priorities really are. To Jonah, his hatred for the Ninevites is more important than God's grace. Jonah hates the Ninevites so much that he wants God to destroy them anyway. In fact, now that God has shown compassion on Nineveh, Jonah would rather die. He's probably seen as a traitor in Israel, especially now that God was blessing the people that he saw as the scum of the earth. So Jonah was so angry that he says, I would just be better for me to die. Now this leads us back to that third question. What is God trying to teach Jonah? When Jonah says that it would be better for him to die, God asks him a question in response and says, is it right for you to be angry? Think of it this way. Nineveh was a bunch of heathens, but they turned and followed God when they heard Jonah's warning. Jonah is actually the Christian here. He's the one who has a relationship with God. He knows God's laws and decrees. He knows how he should be acting. And yet he's the one acting like a greater heathen here. It's as if God is showing Jonah more grace and more patience, even though Jonah should have known better. That's why God asks, have you any right to be angry? God uses the vine to demonstrate to Jonah the air of his thinking to show how cold his heart really is. If you recall, Jonah goes outside of the city to wait for Nineveh's destruction. God causes a vine to grow to provide shade and then causes a worm to come and destroy the vine. And again, Jonah is so upset that he says it's, he's angry enough to die. God demonstrates that Jonah cares more for the vine, which he did not tend to or make grow, than he does for the people of Nineveh, the city he wants destroyed. It says God is saying, Jonah, look what you are saying. You did not cause a plant to grow, and yet you loved it and wanted it to survive. Neither did you cause Nineveh to grow, and yet you wanted it to be destroyed. 
Nineveh is full of 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left. In other words, they are ignorant about me and my requirements. They do not know good from evil. And yet, Jonah, if you had to choose between 100, 120,000 people and a plant, you would choose the plant. For as much as the book is about Jonah, the book is really about you and me. What about you? Does your heart look more like Jonah's than you care to admit? Are there people in your life that are difficult to love? Now remember, you and I are hard to love as well. But God called Jonah to preach to the Nemites. And who is God prompting you to share the gospel with today or this week or this coming month? I shared with you about ICOM's missions conference in November. And sometimes I feel like people misunderstand what missions is really all about. Missions is really about anyone who shares Jesus with their neighbor, whether their neighbor is across the street or around the world. But too often, missions is thought of something otherworldly that only superhuman people do to the unreached peoples of the world. <laughs> missions is simply God's followers sharing the name of Jesus with the lost. That's why I'm so passionate about ICOM. We want to encourage and equip you to share the name of Jesus at every opportunity. Do not fear or be afraid as you share the name of Jesus. His power resides in you. If God appoints even a worm to accomplish his purposes like he does here in this story of Jonah, he can definitely use you. Today is your Faith Promise Sunday, the day in which you pledge to support a specific list of mission organizations and missionaries devoted to sharing the name of Jesus. I encourage you to take this pledge seriously. These Christian people and organizations can only do their good work, can only do the Lord's work with support of faithful churches like yours. I know this is an uncertain time for many people and in many ways with uncertainty about school, jobs, income, health, and family. I encourage you to pray diligently over this faith promise pledge. God will provide for you and your family the same way he provides those serving in full-time ministry. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our Father, I thank you for always being in control, even when it doesn't seem like it to us. And I thank you that you have love and compassion for all people, not just some who meet a set of requirements. I thank you for the book of Jonah and all that we have to learn from it. I pray that our hearts will be softened and that we will love our neighbor and our enemies. I pray that we will not be self-righteous like Jonah. Rather, I pray that we will listen to your spirit and that we will go where you send us and share your name where you lead us. I pray for ICON this fall that churches from all over will come to be connected to each other and the work you are doing around the world. I pray that the health and political landscape in the country is such that your church body can come together in November and worship and praise your holy name. I pray for Tower Hill this morning as they consider a missions pledge to you. I pray that you will lead and guide your people in the paths of righteousness. I pray for all the organizations and missionaries they support, that your name may be proclaimed and your will be done. In Jesus' most precious name, amen.